Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining the Road to Six Figure Data Science Job with Richard. I'm your host, Jay, and Richard is our data science guinea pig. And so today we're on episode five. So Richard, how are you doing? How are the assignments? How's your life going? Life is just really busy in general. School is nearing the end of the semester, so doing a lot of projects. And then also trying to practice uh, interview query questions, trying to make time for that. How is school busy? What's the work-life balance that you have right now? Yeah, so one of my projects I'm doing for a data visualization class, we're trying to make a recommender system and a, like a visualization for how to display the trustworthiness of users uh, for a recommended book um, for, uh, uh, you know, we're basically were you given the data website. set. Were you given the data set or did you have to scrape the data? We found a data set online. It's the Goodreads data set. We chose it because it was relatively clean. Didn't have okay. to scrape it on our own. Uh, okay, okay, gotcha, gotcha. That yeah, the sense. focus of the project was really more the visualization aspect and then like the algorithm, the recommendation algorithm we're trying to apply to it. How are you the person who like does most of the work in your group or are you like hanging out and like someone else is doing most of the work for this, by the way? I just want to know, like... How is the group dynamic right now for these projects with data science? Because I remember doing them in school and like, I feel like one person does most of the work. I mean, I feel like it's pretty balanced. There's different directions that each person goes through. Luckily, we have one person that has a lot of front end experience, um, able to do visualizations in D3. I'm working mostly on like the database back end side. Another person's working on like the recommender system. So it's really uh, okay. a combination. It was, it was, we have a five person group and I'd you just say, left out two people there. That aren't doing shit. <laughs> well, I have another person working on the API with me, another person exploring a different recommendation system. Oh, okay. So there's, I mean, there's different directions that the project goes. And sometimes we don't want to pursue a direction because it's not going to work for our project. So that's one project, have a couple others. But yeah. So for this data visualization class, I mean, how often do you as a data scientist, like, did you need to utilize software like D3 or whatever to explain your data to an audience? Never. Why would you use D3 also? Because D3 is like super complicated. So I think it's like really cool to do it for a project, but practically speaking, it's like so complex, at least for most data scientists, unless you're really good at D3 for you to then actually use in real life for like a real project. Like we would just use Streamlit or like the easiest thing that you could do to convey your information across because it doesn't make a lot of sense to spend a lot of time on the visualization when that would hamper you from just doing more work and more analyses in real life. Right. So I guess what you're saying is it's the analysis that that's what's matter and not so much telling the story, or I guess telling the story is probably the most important part of having the narrative, but like being able to visualize this data, you know, in a web or. Yeah. I mean, how much does it matter that the little lines move when you're presenting it versus just like telling the story, right? Obviously you care about crafting a better story than like having like a really nice visualization. Now, of course it probably matters for like consumer facing apps. Like if I'm designing a dashboard for my health on like the Apple watch, then I want that thing to look really cool because it's going to be used by millions of people. But if it's literally B2B or like internal facing, then most people don't put in a lot of effort there. And they just realize that most of their time is better well spent working on more projects than like getting this one project done 100% complete, which is one of my gripes with university projects too, because I feel like a lot of people really try to get that A, but they don't realize that most of it life is about just getting a bunch of B minuses as fast as possible. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I mean, I, I take it as an approach of like, I'm learning a new technology. I've never used D3 before or some of the other visualization stuff and just approaching it as how do I learn something new? You know, and a lot of it right now is, you know, using chat GPT, knowing what questions to ask using Google, figuring out the structure of my data. I think those foundational skills are useful, but yeah, I mean, in terms of if I'll ever use D3 in my next job or something, I think that's a, that's another question. And maybe you're right. Like maybe I'll use something simpler, like Excel, more just Matplotlib and Python for easy visualizations. 
Yeah, I mean, you've seen the interview query like visualization tool set, right? It's SQL and then Google Sheets. I mean, that's the more realistic nature of it. Though, if you work for bigger companies, and I got this question the other day, actually, where someone was asking me if I use Looker. And then you always have to like go into the spiel about how like the tool that you use doesn't really matter, right? It's just like, basically, you can use any tool that you want. Once you become an experienced data scientist, it's more about how you convey that information. It's good that you're learning these things because once you learn one, then you learn them all effectively because at the end of the day, you're just trying to figure out how to visualize it in a way that provides the best meaning for the end users, at least for your career side. In terms of academia, it's probably different. Makes sense. I wanted to ask you about your previous experience working at Jobber or Monster. I think you said you worked on like the recommendation system for jobs for different users. Like, how did you go about that? How did you put together your data sets? Like the stuff I'm doing right now for the analysis for the profile data, when you have a bunch of just raw data, not super clean, not super structured, how did you get it into a usable form? How long did that take you? And what kind of struggles did you go through when doing this? And then how did you simplify it? You know, because sometimes you don't have data for something and you have to just ignore a certain aspect of the data. Mm, yeah, okay. So I guess it depends on what your end goal is. But like, let's say for this Goodreads book matching project, do you guys have data on like what books people actually read and liked and stuff in this data set? Is that how you yeah, guys Yeah, so we have interactions and reviews data sets. So they have book IDs and then user IDs, what the users rated the books and then like the reviews for each book. Gotcha. And this is off of Kaggle or something, right? As well, where uh, it's not, I think is. there is a, there is data on Kaggle for this, but it wasn't from Kaggle, but it's something similar. Yes. Gotcha. So you are basically given the user profile, then their interactions now predict it for someone new, right? Recommend a new book for them that we think they'll like. Yeah. Yeah, 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 exactly. So, I mean, a lot of it is pretty tough because if you think about the recommendation engine, most of the time you can only recommend new stuff whenever you call the API or let me back up here. Basically, there's two problems in recommendation engines, right? There's the cold start problem, which is basically you have nothing about this user that you know. So you have to recommend them something and then you're given some data about the user and then you have to start recommending them stuff because you're given that data about them. Cold start problem. There's a bunch of stuff that you can read about like how to recommend it. That was one of our biggest problems on Jobber because in industry versus academia, you actually have to care about outcomes, which is basically increasing the number of jobs that people to apply to, right? And every single user comes in with basically only their resume on Jobber because it was a job recommendation app. And that was it. And it's not like we had any data on which ones they liked and which ones they didn't like. Additionally, you also have marketplaces dynamics. So you have these jobs that people would want to apply for that they're not qualified at all for. And then you also have these jobs that they were probably qualified for that they didn't want, right? No one wants a job that they already have. If you uploaded your resume today, they'd probably recommend you a bunch of industry logistic type jobs that you would hate because you're trying to go through a career change, right? But that's all that you're qualified for on your resume right now. So again, job matching is super hard. Same thing could be said about books, right? Because naturally you would recommend someone a lot of sci-fi books. They previously read a lot of sci-fi books, but you don't really get a lot from their profile unless you can see what their past read history is and other things. So if I'm a new user on Goodreads and I just sign up, you literally have zero information about this user. So you're probably just going to recommend them the top 10 books that everyone loves for them to actually do well in terms of an actual like outcome. But because you're building a theoretical data set, it's so much harder for you to like really get any feedback in terms of like what's actually going to prepare you for your real job because you won't ever get this real life data. So all you're going to see is like, oh, we built this recommendation engine. You know, I fed it some data, give me back some books that I think I would read and cool, I get an A, right? That's it. So like in general, the lack of feedback is what's tough for all these projects. I'm glad you're learning, you know, how to build one though, right? But you're not, you know, basically you're getting like 20% of it, even though a lot of the time master's students think they're getting like, you know, I'm doing all this stuff. I can put it all on my resume, but you know, real life, you're only getting 20% of the puzzle until you get that real data from like real industry back. You got to see like what's happening. So yes, another like kind of general rant on like how master's students need to prepare with like more real life data. But I hope you're learning a lot from this recommendation engine stuff. And I hope you're enjoying it because it's going to get a lot harder once you get that real data science job. Does that answer your question at all? 
I don't even know what your question was now. Yeah, okay. Linda, I just wanted to know, like, what was your strategy for recommending? Like, you talk about the cold start problem. For our project, we overcame that problem by forcing the user to input, like, three books and their ratings for it. And we also added, like, a novelty slider, which basically ask them how close do you want your recommendation to the books that you already gave or do you want something new and something different um, so that's how we solve the cold start problem but as far as like job recommendations go with just a resume in hand how did you overcome that yeah I mean uh, we didn't overcome it actually I mean we just did basically what I just said which was continuously try to find stuff that was relevant to their resume that they would then um, use because Think about this cold start problem that you fixed and you overcame, right? How many people you think are going to actually go through and give you, you know, three books plus their review for it and then a novelty slider before they go like, fuck it, I'm done with this like recommendation algorithm. It's too much work for me. It's much easier for me to just close this tab and go to YouTube, right? I would say like in real life, right? Like don't say anything is solved realistically, right? All we've done is introduce a new variable into like the equation, right? Of the system of the business, right? In a perfect world, all of our users give us as much data as they can. But that is one of the things that we were dealing with at Jobber, which is that basically half the people, once they're prompted with uploading their resume, would just not do it, or they would just pass on uploading their resume. So now we don't even have their resume. All we know is their name, and like that's it and now we have to apply to them we have to give them jobs to recommend to so like i would say that most of these things aren't optimized through data science at the end of the day they're more optimized through analytics and a general understanding that if you or if you shouldn't ask them to do this if you or if you shouldn't change the ui to do this versus actual data science optimization of improving the recommendations right if you are literally selling a book recommendation tool then yeah you should probably ask them and improve that recommendation algorithm but for us we were literally trying to get people into jobs and not match them with their perfect job so to speak even though that's what your goal is but mostly trying to get this person a job that's a different meaning than getting them their perfect job. With book recommendation, you have to think about it the same way with the stakes. So I'd say like, you know, it was really hard to solve. We didn't really solve it completely. There's a lot of hacks you can do in terms of like edge cases and rules and heuristics you can build in, which probably comprise of most recommendation systems to solve for like their business edge cases and their business outcomes. But yeah, super hard thing to do. Got it. And I'm also curious, like the specific algorithms, what was your strategy for you know, the recommendation, what kind of algorithms did you use? What kind of tools did you use for that? Yeah, from my understanding, I think we just used a standard off the shelf XG boost algorithm. We actually used just like an elastic search algorithm too. And the reason why was because a lot of the optimizations we could make were based off of performance and latency more than actual like data science model accuracy. So this is now the engineering constraint part of industry that you don't see in academia, which is basically if I have to recommend you a book, let's say I have to do it fast right now. And Goodreads kind of sucks as a platform. So it's not a great example of this, but basically people are more likely to use your app if it's faster. And so if you have a really complex model that has bad performance. Most of this can be solved through ML ops, but back then the best thing we could do was basically just build an elastic search model because elastic search is fast. We stuff it with a bunch of keywords from the user's resume and we just had them search jobs and return like the most relevant results. That was awesome because most of the time you also have to think these users don't have really good fast internet connections, right? So if you're using an algorithm that is like really, really complex and maybe is like 10% better, but like 10 times slower, that's going to get destroyed by like an elastic search performance based algorithm, which is essentially just like an engineering search tool kit out of the box, but just repurposed for um, recommendations. That's one thing I actually learned a lot of as well is basically how much those things mattered. That's interesting. We actually came across the same issue as well. Our interactions or reviews uh, data table was like 11 million rows of data and it just took way too long. Even like a normal SQL search for like a book ID took maybe like 20 seconds or something. Obviously, we're not going to wait for a website page to load for 20 seconds. So we had to come up with different strategies in order to work around that. So what you said is pretty interesting, just in terms of the runtime of the program mattering more than the actual accuracy of it. So I think that's good to know.
yeah and it's not that it always matters more it's just there's a general trade-off so most people set constraints for the api like response time limits at least for recommendation algorithms especially if it's your main product if it just shows up you know below the fold when you're scrolling on goodreads then maybe it doesn't matter as much but if you're literally going to an app and it's like jobs are being recommended for you and there's a little circle thing that's just like continuously <laughs> you know, running, then, uh, you know, definitely matters a ton to get that thing really, really fast versus maybe more accurate for your position. And especially because of that imbalance on our side, right? If you buy a book, you know, you could read any kind of book, it doesn't really matter. But like a job, the other person on the other end has to really like your resume too, in your profile. So if you think about it, Goodreads, book matching is just one to many. And then job matching is more like the quality kind of has to be there on both sides. It doesn't really matter if you're reading a super technical book or non-technical book. If you like it and you buy it, then it doesn't matter if you finish it or not, right? I mean, ideally, Goodreads wants you to finish it. But like at the end of the day, you know, it's all about you putting in the tent to find that book. Great questions. All right, next week, Richard. So we're going to go over some more Python interview questions. We didn't do that today, but next week we're going to go over another harder Python question and we'll go over it together and work through it. And then we'll also review and benchmark your skills finally in terms of saying where you are right now, where you're going to go forward and just map out like a small curriculum plan for the next two months, likely focused on coding. Sound good? Sound good. Thanks.